Deep into the Pacific Ocean lies an island which has astonishing statues that give us an idea of unveiling ancient mysteries from the past. The Moais on Easter Island come in different shapes and sizes, but there are specific ones that have detail left behind on the back of them. These specific Moai are on the far side of the island. You'll need to drive there from the touristic side of the island and then arrive to where the oldest Moai reside. These Moai statues are scattered everywhere across this mountainside and all possess this eerie blank stare on their face, all looking towards one side of the island. When you're walking around this ancient location and seeing these ruins, you can clearly see that they are all positioned to adorn something significant. If you check a sky map or a star map for a constellation alignment at night around these statues, you'll find that the Sirius star and the constellation of the hunter including Orion's belt is upside down but still present. This constellation is shown directly in front to where all of the Moai from the Ranu Raraku site are looking. These statues are pointing in the same direction just like other ancient places and buildings are in the world that have the Sirius star or Orion's belt in alignment to their structure. Could this be coincidental or were these statues positioned like this to represent something more significant? A clue for this significance can be found on the back of some of these statues. These engravings are just pieces that shed light upon which culture or who actually built these statues and these ancient ruins. The astonishing possibility that the enigmatic symbols carved into the back of the Moai of Easter Island is not just an isolated mystery, but a piece to the puzzle of an area of marking clues that links ancient civilizations across continents and millennia. This is the only piece of writing that was ever found on the island besides the back of the Moai. It entails the same bird symbol which is also present in other parts of the world. The translation of this ancient slab has been deciphered by Sergi Rajabchikov and the published book The Rongo Rongo Script has been deciphered in May of 2016. He uses Hawaiian and Western Polynesian language that reached New Zealand as a base of translated words. The decipher of the name of the island Rapa Nui translates to the Great Rapa or meaning the navel of the world. The rock engraving also contains stories devoted to the comparison of the religious beliefs concerning the sun and the darkness in New Zealand and at Rapa Nui. It basically provides a following Morai charm in order to cause the sun to shine. But the important thing to know is that their identity and language was different than other civilizations. Meanwhile, their stone buildings were similar to other civilizations that had the same stone buildings. These civilizations were allegedly not in contact with each other during that time. The Polynesian civilization, the Mesoamerican civilizations, and other ancient Andean civilizations allegedly never met, but have similar culture and stonework. A lot of studies shy away from the fact that the similarity of cultures show that there was some transfer of knowledge during the ancient past. All ancient civilizations have their own origin story, but there's always a common plot where there are similar events or people mentioned. The origin story from the native people of Easter Island tells a story about a creator of humanity named Maki Maki. He is always mentioned as the bird god, but despite what this entity is claimed to be, the Polynesian stories tell that he appeared tall and then in the form of an old man. He had a face with large eyes and a long nose. They also mention specifically that he arrived with no women by his side. There are depictions of him in engravings all across Easter Island into the rock ground, but one of them stands out the most. The engraving displays a face with wide eyes, a long nose, and a beard. This depiction of Maki Maki shows a common trait amongst other depictions in the origin stories from ancient civilizations. In South America and modern day Bolivia, there is an ancient site called Tiwanaku with a similar origin story with a person called Viracocha. Viracocha is the creator deity in the pre Inca mythology in the Andes region of South America. According to the story, he had a tall human appearance and was depicted with having a beard and a mustache. It is also mentioned that he made the order for the construction of the Temple of Tiwanaku and it is also said he was accompanied by men that were referred to as Viracochas. 
could Viracocha and his followers, the Viracochas, and Maki Maki, the bird cult, be the same group of hermetic travelers? Were these the same group of people who traveled from Easter Island to South America? Were these the people responsible for teaching knowledge such as constructing the ancient monolithic buildings to these primitive civilizations? Were these the people that were described in the pre-Andean and Polynesian origin story? In the Andean mountains in South America, there is a small town called Ayante Tambo which has a giant face sculpted along the cliffside wall. This sculpture that overlooks the town is of the creator deity Viracocha, depicting him with a long beard. The Inca civilization and other pre-Andean civilizations adorned this deity for coming to their lands to teach them, built many stone structures, and then left them. Here's a comparison of a photograph of the Allente Tambo mountain on the left and a drawing of Viracocha in its iconography on the right. It depicts Viracocha with a beard and a bag or a sack of resources, such as supplies and food, to help a civilization. In the book Cusco in the Sacred Valley of the Incas by Fernando Elorieta Salazar, there is a quote where it describes Viracocha, but also him having a messenger. The quote says, he is described as the pilgrim preacher of knowledge, the master knower of time, and described as a person with superhuman power, a tall man with short hair, dressed like a priest or an astronomer with a tunic and a bonnet with four pointed corners." End quote. Who were these travelers that was led by this one specific person or entity that traveled to the Andean region in South America during the ancient past? There is another account of traveling stone masons that existed during the ancient past. According to the historical book, The Travels of Pedro Cieza de Leon from 1532 ACE, a linguist and explorer wrote, I asked the natives if these stone structures were built in the time of the Incas, but they could not say who exactly made them. They added that they had heard from their fathers that all they saw was done in one night. They mentioned that a bearded man and his followers were the builders. They came to these many parts many ages before the Incas began to reign and formed a settlement here. From this and from the fact that they also speak of bearded men on the island of Lake Titicaca. Perhaps before the Incas reigned, there was an intelligent civilization who came from some unknown part and who did these things. South America isn't the only place where a teacher or groups of ancient hermetic travelers have been documented in historical context. In North America, the Maya and the Mexicas or Aztec civilizations both share a similar story about an ancient traveler or travelers. In the Yucatan Peninsula in modern day Mexico resides the pyramid complex Chichen Itza. At the bottom of the pyramid bases have the feather serpents these serpents represent the Ku Klux Klan cult. This deity is known for arriving one day to this area in the past, providing knowledge to the ancient Mayans, helping them build their stone structures, and then leaving. Who was this teacher that traveled to this ancient civilization, and why is the story so similar throughout the Americas? On the other side of the country of Mexico are the Teotihuacan pyramids, this civilization also had the similar deity but called Quetzalcoatl, whom was also depicted as a feathered serpent. Quetzalcoatl has the same characteristics of Kukulkan, but he is the deity of the Mexicas of the Aztecs. The Maya and the Mexicas were in contact with each other by trade, but with the advanced pyramids that they created, it tells a different story. This is significant because it also relates to the god Viracocha, who I mentioned before. All three of these deities have the same origin story and what these gods or person has done. All three of these entities have arrived to the land and taught the natives, helped build stone structures, and left one day promising to return. Who was this teacher or group of people during the ancient past? All of these gods that have the same characteristics are located on the west coast of the Americas. If the Mesoamerican and South American gods never were in contact with each other, how did they both have similar origin stories involving a certain traveler? 
There is an engraving at the ancient site of Tiwanaku, Bolivia, depicting the god Viracocha holding two staffs. In the top center of this doorway, you'll see the symbol or depiction of this entity holding the staffs. This is Viracocha holding two staffs in his hand. The staffs are supposed to be snakes, which represent dualities and elements for creation and power. These staffs are also depicted in other deities around the world. In the late 18th century BCE, the late generation god Marduk of ancient Mesopotamia, who is also the son of Enki, the main creator god, is also depicted to be holding two snake staffs. This type of depiction of a deity is also shown in ancient Egypt with the ancient god Horus, the son of Ra, holding two snakes. All of these gods have the same characteristics, which is holding the two staffs or snakes and being the son of the main creator deity. These are just one set of examples of many type of similarities between these gods in the Americas and from the other side of the world. This stone sculpture was during the time of the ancient Mexicas or Aztecs in modern day Mexico. This is a god with seven snake heads representing the god Chico Mexcotl or the mother goddess. This seven-headed entity is also shown in ancient India with the goddess Manasa being depicted with seven snakes behind her head or as her head. And most widely known is the depiction of the handbag carried by the ancient Olmec deity, the first feathered serpent god from before the Mexicas or Aztecs in 1000 BCE. This deity is depicted in his flying serpent holding what appears to be a bag. This bag is also shown in ancient Mesopotamia and other places around the world. But are these actually bags, buckets, or something else? Do these symbols represent a society of people, or was it used for something more practical? In this museum in Mexico, you can see this stone has a very similar shape to those bags. Is this just a coincidence in shape and size? A replica of what it actually is? Or was this the actual object being held in those stone engravings from long ago? One clue to finding out what this object once was can be found in modern day Turkey at the most ancient site ever uncovered called Gobekli Tepe. This site was created around 9500 BCE and more of the surrounding site is still being uncovered today. At one of the pillars in Gobekli Tepe, we can see the bag being shown at the top of this pillar. This T-shaped pillar has engravings on it that have plenty of interpretations such as depicting astronomical events or depictions of the current life during that time. The bag-like objects could also represent a physical depiction. At the top of the pillar, we can see an animal next to each bag-like object and these animals represent which storage house is for which. Right below these bag-like objects show designs which can be wreaths of tall grass binded together to make an enclosure for the animals. Could all of these purposes be true and perhaps this T-shaped pillar depicts a physical depiction of livestock and the environment they lived in while showing an astronomical event that occurred in the past? Could these real-life engravings represent a calendar counting the amount of years that has passed? In multiple ancient civilizations, these symbols represented a weight system unit while also being used as a tool for smoothing or abrasing a rock sculpture or monolith. These objects could have even represented the entire Milky Way galaxy as depicted by the ancient Egyptians. What's known about these symbols is that they were depicted throughout multiple cultures spread out across the globe during the ancient past. There are other stone statues that have similar features throughout other cultures such as the figures with the arms crossed and human figures with arms holding their own stomach. But these are just generic positions of the human body. Is there any evidence more than just these similar statues? For humans to record time, they needed to utilize their language to explain the information that they documented. Ancient humans and civilizations that were separated from each other by distance expressed their language in different ways from each other by how it's written, read, and spoken. Even though there are major differences, there are still some very shocking similarities in common. 
While there are still some Mayan scripts or glyphs remaining, most of the ancient glyphs were destroyed in the 16th century, but from what we know, they're red in paired columns, from left to right and top to bottom. Meanwhile, the Easter Island's Rongo Rongo glyphs were written left to right and bottom to top. The Nahuatl language and Quechua language are also different from each other. They all differ in multiple ways and most likely evolved over time by themselves. Although there are some words between all of the early American languages that are similar and hold the same meaning behind them, this proves that while ancient humans traveled, they also left their culture behind. The pharaoh Akhenaten reigned over ancient Egypt from 1353 to 1336 BCE. His name is significant to the connection of distant languages spoken on earth. The name Akhenaten or Akhenaten means the son of the god Aten or Atun. Atun was the main sun god deity of ancient Egypt during that time. From the ancient lore, Akhenaten is famous for his song to the sun, his poetic hymn to the sun. And in Quechua, his name translated would mean the flute of the sun. In the ancient language of Quechua, which is spoken by the ancient Incas, has two words that have similar meaning in the name Akhenaten. When using the letter A or the A sound in Quechua, it's to make notice, to be, or use to announce someone. Removing this letter in the beginning of the name Akhenaten will break the name into two words, which are Kena and Atun. The word Gena, from the beginning of the name Akhenaten, which is pronounced Gena or Gena, means Andean flute in the Quechua language. And the word Atun means something divinely large, just like the sun god in the Quechua language. In the ancient Inca society, the honorary title that the high members of the Inca court received was called Ancha Atun Apu Inti Puchuri. In that sentence, the word Atun has a H letter silent, which will be pronounced as Atun. The word Apu in that sentence in Quechua means lords. And in ancient Egypt, the word Apu can be found from the hieroglyph meaning O Gods or O Lords. It's strange that these translations align to the story of Akhenaten playing the flute to the gods or a god. It's almost as if this was a story passed down and the words were broken up and changed over time. This could have been a story told to civilizations from ancient travelers, or stories passed down through generations of civilizations that have migrated over time. Around the reign of Akhenaten and slightly after into the 14th century BCE was a period of civilization that isn't well documented in the Andean region in South America. An ancient Andean civilization called the Karal Supe civilization lasted until 1800 BCE. Meanwhile, the Chavan civilization, which was thought to have been primarily a religious and traveling movement, started at 900 BCE. Around the same time, the Paraka civilization were have said to have arrived around 800 BCE as travelers from the ocean. They also have a strange connection of having elongated skulls, which is just like the shape of Akhenaten's head and other ancient Egyptians. It's also said that they brought extensive knowledge of irrigation and water management to the coast of modern-day Peru and the Andean region. The only civilization that was around during this time is called the Cupis Nike civilization, which existed in the northern area of Peru around 1250 BCE. Although the date to when they existed is still being debated today, what's significant about this is that the majority of the artifacts found are religious content which were used in ceremonies and as funerary offerings. Most of them are vases or water buckets that contain water. Could these be the water buckets that were displayed during antiquity? They serve the same purpose and look exactly like the ones from the ancient Sumerian gods and the ancient Olmec gods. Besides being a tool, it could serve as another purpose to hold water. This is not just a coincidence that the Olmec civilization existed during 1200 BC, which is right after this specific time, where they said that their gods arrived with these bags or buckets. There must be some connection of language that could tell us a little bit more about this ancient connection between these civilizations. There is a highly debated artifact called the Fuente Magna Bowl. It was first discovered in the 1960s in Bolivia on the shores of Lake Titicaca by a local farmer. 
Some of its inner engraving resembles Sumerian cuneiform writing, which is located in the same area of modern-day southern Iraq, although some experts claim it is a fake due to the glyphs not being real. If you look closely, some cuneiform writing are backwards, have extra lines, or are missing specific marks in the glyph. But the cuneiform that is written is believed to be Proto-Sumerian writing, which is an older form of cuneiform. This is why some of the symbols do not match up. If this artifact is real, it could date as far back to 3500 BCE. Even though some of the glyphs may seem backwards or slightly different, this could be an artistic change to a person's name or whatever it's describing. In addition, this bowl could have been used as a cast or they could have used polished metal to mirror the backwards glyphs. During antiquity, there were multiple scenarios where ancient humans could have voyaged the globe. These travelers influenced other tribes and civilizations. Besides their culture and language, they also left behind an incredibly intriguing mark on this earth. Scattered across modern day Peru and Bolivia and South America, a legacy of ancient stonework is still present today. These awe-inspiring stone marvels reveal the mastery of ancient engineers who shared specific techniques. At the ancient site of Tiwanaku and Pumapunku in Bolivia, there are blocks here that show a specific way these engineers held the stone blocks together into place for such a long time. This ancient stone construction technique is similar to other methods that have been used throughout different parts of the world. One of these is the ancient way to address large stones together by creating a recess into the stone and pouring a mix of hot copper and tin, which will then harden to make bronze. These T-shaped bronze clamps will lock the blocks together, holding them without using mortar. This is another way of using anathyrosis. This technique was used in the ancient site of Allente Tambo, Vitkos, and Tiwanaku to hold some of the blocks together. All of these sites are located very far apart from each other. Why is it that these locations on this continent are the only areas that display this level of ancient stonework and metal smelting? At the ancient site of Sacsayhuaman in Cusco, there are large polygonal stones stacked together creating giant walls. These monolithic stones may weigh up to 200 tons and are still debated by how they were moved or even extracted and shaped. There is one theory that provides a great explanation on how these were shaped. During antiquity, these builders used chemicals and abrasion to slowly shape the stone. They would use a pyrite mud with other materials that would create a sulfuric acid, which makes the stone easier to use abrasion while using the same type of stone. This is why you will see a different color or a tint of orange around the creases. In this photograph that I took, it shows two stones at Sacsayhuaman. You can clearly see the orange color on both rocks along the edges and on the surfaces where the two stones would lay against each other. To be specific, the granite and andesite stone have quartz mixed in with it. A sulfuric acid can dissolve or etch down quartz. Once this is broken down, the granite stone itself can be carved easier, or as some may say, become softer, while using another stone to smooth it out. The sulfuric acid is also a strong oxidizer that enhances the combustion of other substances. The Inca were using this combination to also make it a combustible to heat the stone. This substance or mixture is not found today, but is documented by the Spanish chroniclers that steam would disperse out from the creases of the polygonal stone blocks while the walls were under construction. Besides the Inca lore claiming that they did not build the walls, they did mention that the walls would build themselves. Perhaps this was mistaken or a misrepresentation of using chemistry alongside of stone masonry skills. If the ancient builders were using chemicals such as sulfuric acids, they could have even used a hydrochloric acid which would easily break down granite. This hydrochloric acid could even be made from vinegar reacting with salt which was highly abundant in the Andean mountains. In this video, you can see the salt mines, which are of said to be in use going back to the Inca Empire or even earlier. It's astonishing that these ancient civilizations utilize their natural resources in these sophisticated ways. 
On the other side of the world in Egypt, this similar technique of anathyrosis is present with the metal clamps and there is a theory of how the ancient Egyptians carved away at granite. It's called the natron theory and it involves the ancient Egyptians using this sodium carbonate which looks like a white powder. This substance was also used for their mummification process and was abundant in the area. When the natron is heated to 850 Celsius, which can be done with charcoal, it will be able to dissolve or eat away at the granite. Since granite is 70 to 77% quartz, the rest is granite feldspar grains. The heated natron breaks down quartz, making multiple holes throughout the rock. This may have been one of the methods used to initially sculpt the granite rock down into the desired shape. The ancient stone builders, or at least the spread of their ancient knowledge, seem to have left a lasting imprint on civilizations around the world. The emergence of shared cultural practices, languages, and writing systems across the globe suggests a profound connection across all of the civilizations. Most notably, the architectural wonders they created from imposing monoliths to intricately designed stone structures reveal striking similarities despite the geographical distances. Whether through physical migration or the spread of their ideas, these master stone builders profoundly influenced human history, forging a legacy that links ancient cultures through their timeless stone constructions.